everyone, and welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and you know, on this series, we like to do different things, including uh, whenever we can, um, introduce somebody who's in either a new position or just coming into town, uh, introduce them to the community and the community to them. Well, it's a little odd to be introducing the chief of uh, our fire department because he's been here for a good long while, uh, but he just became chief about two years ago. And, um, and this is our first opportunity, given the pandemic, et cetera, to be here uh, and be able to speak with our fire chief, Kevin Kelly. So first of all, I wanna welcome you very much. Thank um, you and welcome here. And thank you for welcoming us here. Mm -hmm. It's been several years since we were last here and uh, the place still looks sparkling clean mm. and impressive. Well, it's nice to have a civilian in here finally. You know? <laughs> and, and it feels like we're starting to head in the right direction to be able Absolutely. to do something like this. So and we should make good. note for our audience <clears throat> that you and I are sitting here and we are six feet apart, right. but we're without masks right. and we can do that right. because both of us are fully vaccinated and thank goodness yes. we're, we're starting to enjoy the fruits of that. Right. And we want to encourage you, obviously, um, if you have not yet been vaccinated, please do get a vaccine. Among other things, you get to start to enjoy doing stuff like this again. Um, so anyway, really nice to, to talk to you. And what I'd like to do today um, is just talk to you a little bit about your own personal journey okay. uh, getting here okay. um, to this position. Um, and, then, and then kind of a little bit uh, behind the scenes here at the fire department and answering some probably pretty basic questions. Um, but we'll see how the conversation okay. unfolds. Certainly. So chief, let me ask you, first of all, um, I remember when I was a kid, okay. I remember lots of kids right. who, uh, whose answer to what do you want to be when you grow up right. is I want to be a firefighter, right. right? Um, lots of us feel that way for a little while, right. uh, when we're kids and go in other directions, sure. obviously. Was that the case for you? Were no. You, did you know this then? No, no I didn't. I, I, I certainly, when I was a kid, admired police officers and, and firefighters. But I had an uncle who was a Cambridge lieutenant, and I always respected him. Uh, I had no plans on being a firefighter. But what happened was, I graduated high school in 1983, and uh, here at Arlington, here in Arlington High, I started working. And about 10 months into work, I wasn't very happy. I got a call from a recruiter, an Air Force recruiter, and the rest is history. To say. I joined the Air Force shortly after, went in in 1984, did four years active duty. I spent three years in Illinois and one year in Korea. Oh, and I was a firefighter. They, I, they assigned me my job. I went in without a job assignment. They made me a firefighter, which was serendipitous, I'll have to say. And, um, and really interesting. I think people <clears throat> probably, when they think about the Air Force, they're, you know, obviously they go to the, the, the most obvious positions first. Right, we right. Do. Um, and, Firefight, explain, you know, what's well, the role of firefighters there? Yeah, Air Force, Air Force bases are towns. They have police departments and fire departments and um, commissaries, or, you know, um, like grocery, grocery stores, stores right. and gymnasiums and movie theaters, and they have to be staffed. A lot of times they're staffed by civilians, but also they're staffed by mm. GIs. So, uh, again, they, I was assigned as a firefighter. I went to the fire academy in 1984, the Air Force Fire Academy. That was in Illinois. Uh, I was then actually, which was kind of odd, assigned to this, that base, and I stayed there for three years, and it was a great experience. And then I did my last year in Korea, which was which was spectacular. You know, I, is I, that right? Yeah. I, well, I you know I, I joined the Air Force to travel. I wanted to see the world, and not that maybe Illinois, not just Illinois, not huh? cornfields. <laughs> you know, not that again. I had a great experience out there, and I mm -hmm. still have my friends that I talk to and I and I see. Um, but I wanted to see the world, so when I got my orders to Korea, uh, that was that was a, a good time. So I went over there. I was 21, 22 years old, mm -hmm. you know, still a kid. I had a great experience over there, and um, yeah. What, so. what it, and, and was the work basically the same? You yes. were basically, you had transferred from Illinois to a base in Korea, yep. but it operates the same way with all the same components. You had the same kind of job. Yeah, a little, little, um, more pressure over in Korea, I'd say, you know, Illinois, you know, it's still a fire department, 
but ironically, we always joke about that here. I was at an Air Force base that didn't have planes. It was a, they call it, the, the, the airport had been shut down there. It was just a training base. Mm -hmm. So for my first three years in the Air Force, I didn't see any planes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was funny. And then I did my year in Korea. So when I got to Korea, there was, you know, it was a totally different ballgame there. There's, there's fighter jets and, and cargo planes and nuclear weapons and all sorts of different things we mm -hmm. had to, to deal with as a fire department. So it was uh, new and exciting. And, and uh, so the, the combination of just that, being at an Air Force base with planes, it sounds silly, but, uh, and then just being in a foreign country and having that experience. I was there just before, I missed the Olympics by, this, this was 1988, I missed the Olympics by four months. But I did go, to go up to the Olympic Village and watch it being built and see some things. So it was, it was just a wonderful experience. I, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. And it really, it was one of those moments that set the course for my life. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here today in front of you, so. Um, yeah, let me just ask you very briefly, like did you get much of an opportunity to get out um, into the area? Like oh. again, you were in a foreign country. Sure. Did you get to see it? Um, did you get off the base much? Did you travel much in Certainly. Southeast Asia? Or? Yeah, well, no, I, 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 all my traveling was in country. Um, but I certainly did take advantage of being in Korea. I you know, went up to Seoul, uh, went up to the DMZ, um, wow. uh, visited some uh, Buddhist temples and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a quick year. You know, you're only there 12 months. Uh, probably should have did more, but I was, you know, 21, 22, just, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> a young kid. And is that, is that how it goes? I mean, you said did my year in Korea. Is that generally yes. like for uh, somebody who's going to have four-year career in, yeah. the, in the military, you'll have three years and then maybe a posting somewhere? Yeah, Korea is what they call a remote tour. And, and every, it's not, if you do four years active duty, just one tour and get out, you could avoid that. You might not get a remote, but anyone who does a career in the military is gonna do at least one or two what they call a remote tour. Can't bring your family, you go for one year, you do your time, mm -hmm. and then you come back. Mm -hmm. it, but if, it, you know, some of the remotes are truly remote. This one wasn't. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I was in Korea. Um, now, I saw uh, 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 men and women there that were married who had families, and it was a different experience. You know, they missed home. For me, I was a single young uh, right. airman, and, uh, and it's what I wanted. You know, I wanted to see the world, so I was happy to be there, and, and it was a great experience. And you said that that kind of set the course for the rest of, of your life. Is that because by the time you, 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 uh, you were done with your tour, you, you knew you wanted to do firefighting as Certainly. a profession? Yeah, so I really enjoyed it, and I came home and uh, immediately took the civil service. So we're a civil service department, and I'll certainly answer questions about that if you want to, but um, I came back and I took the exam. I wasn't sure if I was going to, and I was, my father has passed away, but one piece of advice he gave me, and it really was very important in my life, was uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be a firefighter. I really enjoyed it, but I, I, I thought I was gonna move on. And he's like, just take the test. He goes, you know, and put yourself in the position to say no. You know, don't burn that bridge. And it was, uh, I thank him mm -hmm. for that piece of advice. It was a really good piece of advice. And mm -hmm. I, I t when people, young guys talk, to, oh, gals talk to me now about being a firefighter and, I don't know. I just, just take the test and put yourself in the position. To right. Say no. You you hear yeah. yourself echoing your my father's father. words. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm and I'm glad I followed his advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, anyway, so I took the test, and now it's a waiting game. We're actually in the process now. We're going to be doing some hiring, but it's a long process, and and it takes a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. So you don't know if you're going to get hired. There's other people going for it. So what I did was I went back to work, I got a 40 hour week job and, and started going to college. I went to Middlesex for a year uh, just to see if I could handle it and mm -hmm. that was no problem. So then I transferred to UMass Lowell and graduated in four years, a total of, took me four years and I got my bachelor's degree in uh, computers, uh, in IT. Uh, still hadn't heard from the fire department so I just kept pressing. After that long? After that long wow. and I just kept pressing forward. I actually thought it was kind of an opportunity done. lost, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was working for a computer company up in Bill Ricker. It was the start of my career, and I got a card in the mail saying, we're hiring, are you interested? So I signed the card. And, and when, when was that? How long have you been in, in a firefighter? Well, I, I got hired in 1994. My 27th anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks. I've been here 27 years. But, um, yeah, the process probably took, and ironically, and I also tell people is, I didn't get hired the first time. I went through the hiring process and didn't get selected. Mm. Made it all the way to the town manager, had an interview, but I didn't get picked. Um, 
Um, but I came back, you know, the next year they hired again and I was fortunate enough to get picked that time. So That's great. Yeah, it was great. And when you say you've been here for 27 years, do you mean here in Arlington? Arlington Firefighter for 27 years. Is yeah, that May, right? May so right away you, you, yeah. were, you were assigned here or, or how does that work? How oh, you, okay, that's so a good So you question. applied literally for the job here yes. in Arlington. Yes, and you Got don't, it. you can only get hired here. So, you know, there's it. residency requirements, those kind of things. and. Um, yeah, so I got hired in May 29th, 1994 for the Arlington Fire Department. And, there, and there's no, I mean, there, I shouldn't say no. You can transfer or do laterals to other departments, but that's very rare. You normally just spend your whole career in the town you got hired. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you said that there are residency requirements. Can yeah. we assume then that, that most of the folks who work in this station live here in town? Well, okay. It's <laughs> not, no, not live in Arlington, but so you, to get the residency um, um, privilege, you know, to, you, you have to have it to get on. Mm -hmm. You had to have lived in Arlington one year up to the day you took the test. Got so it. for example, when I got hired, I actually was living in Belmont. But when I took the test, I was an Arlington resident, so I got the residency preference. And then there's also, a military is allowed when they come back, so you can be from Chelmsford, mm -hmm. you come back and say, I want to be an Arlington firefighter, they allow someone returning from the military uh, one shot to pick a town as their preference and um, then they have to establish residency but then they can get hired here. And we have a couple of those. We have a couple of people who have taken advantage of that. So, so yeah, I, uh, I, I now feel even worse saying that I was introducing you to Arlington <laughs> in a sense because of course this has been your workplace for 27, 27 years, years now years, or yeah. close to. Yeah. Um, and how, just very quickly, like what was that trajectory like? Um, Getting hired? Uh, no, from the time that you were hired, okay. from the, you came in as you know the rookie, and, yeah, so and uh, it's hard to remember back then to that. I'm well, sure, can, but. Yeah, it seems like yesterday. It's really not that hard. It's you know, it was, you know, it, it, how time flies. But so I was hired in 1994, and like all, uh, just kind of the processes, I had to go to the fire academy. So I completed the fire academy out in Stowe. And that's about 11 weeks. It's tough but doable, right? And most of us make it through. You just, you know, do you, what you're supposed to do. Uh, and then I had to become an EMT. All. All firefighters in Arlington have to be, I'm still an EMT now, are required to, if they don't have it already, have to get it and maintain it, mm -hmm. or you'll, you'll be terminated, you have to have it. So I completed EMT school and then just started, you know, you're right, the rookie, just back step. Um, I did get promoted quickly. I, in less than three years, I made lieutenant. Um, I was lieutenant, I'm, I don't know, for six or seven years, and then mm -hmm. I took the captain's exam and made captain and uh, was put in the office. So we have two kind of sides of the department. There's the line, the people that go out in the trucks and mm -hmm. answer the calls, and then there's the staff positions, which is the training officer the fire who does training. Mm -hmm. There's the fire prevention officer, who's a deputy chief who does all the inspections and permitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an EMS coordinator who's a captain, and he does all the EMS training, those kind of things. So. Um, I became the training officer as a, when I made captain and did that for a while and then um, through promotions came back to the line, r rode the ladder truck for a few years and then made deputy chief. Uh, at that point that was only about three or four years ago and then I went back into staff and was the fire prevention officer. Did that for a couple of years and then Chief Jefferson retired and I went for the big job and was fortunate enough, yeah. very fortunate to get. We have. Um, um, an embarrassment of riches of very qualified people here that could have been the chiefs. I was mm -hmm. very fortunate to get it. And if, if it wasn't me, I would have been happy to work for any of the other people who got it. You know what I mean? Well, very good people. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we're getting some insight into your leadership style just in terms of the generosity of spirit oh, that, you're, you. that you're demonstrating. So that's great. Uh, several questions that I have Go coming ahead. from what you were just saying. Um, first of all, that sounds like a, to me, a, quite a varied uh, uh, resume for yes. you within this fire within this department is that typical for a chief to have done so many different uh, of the other roles? Yeah, it is. It, but you know, um, yeah, I you know, except for the EMS position, I think I've filled just about every position in the department, which is great. Right, mm -hmm. it, it, it helps me understand what other folks are going through when they're doing the jobs and. Um, which has been helpful for me. But we've had some, um, like Chief Jefferson before me, who chief for 12 years, probably the best chief this department's had. No, no disrespect to the other chiefs, but just longevity and mm -hmm. saw us through the building of the three stations, all those kind of right. things. So just did a great job. He had never been the fire prevention officer. He just, 
his trajectory it just he got lucky a lot of people don't like to go into the staff positions mm -hmm. they like riding the trucks and he mm -hmm. when he got made deputy there was a deputy chief in that position who wanted to stay so he didn't have to do that didn't stop him from being a good chief mm -hmm. um, but he just didn't do that so there, there's certainly more than one career path but I was fortunate to have done a lot of the roles I think it's just been helpful for me so yeah yeah, yeah. As you, as, in the ways that you say in terms of just understanding just, what yeah, somebody understand. else is dealing with and from your own personal experience right. which is great um, Another thing that struck me, though, in what you said, you d you were describing your first, you know, you said, oh, yeah, I was I was a rookie, and so back step, and then later on in your narrative, you said, oh, I wanted to get, you know, I, I rose, I got promoted again, and I went back to the line, and right. back on the truck. So two questions. One is, can you tell us what that means, okay. the back step thing, okay. number one, and number two, um, I get this sense then that uh, the makeup of a uh, fire engine and the people who are in in and on it um, as it's heading out um, is from all different ranks and different sure. levels of experience, Certainly. et cetera. Certainly. So, so just tell us, like, what is that back step position, number okay. one, and then what are the other positions on the fire truck and who, 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 who are those them? Okay, certainly. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can really talk about a fire engine or the ladder truck, you know, the same as mm -hmm. far as positions go. So the back step's usually the, the person who sits in the back. Yeah, yeah. Right? Not, like, not always the junior firefighter, because we have certainly plenty of great firefighters who will do a 30-year career who stay as firefighters. They don't want to promote, that's mm -hmm. fine. You know, we, we need them, they're talented, and, and, it's, and it's great. We, I joked, you know, we don't have the rank of sergeant, but we have sergeants, which are very important, <laughs> those senior guys those, and gals that have that leadership quality that's not given by stripes, just by experience and people listen to. And, and if you are a good officer, you make sure that you have a good right-hand person to help mm -hmm. you with that. But mm -hmm. So that's the back step. You know, they're a firefighter. They're going to be on the nozzle. They're going to be pulling the hose. They're going to be doing the hard work. You right. Know? And they're going to be very publicly visible. As Absolutely. The, you know, that's who so, you know, a little kid is thinking. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's a firefighter. A firefighter. Uh -huh. That's your firefighter. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. And then the other two usually on the rig are the officer. Well, I'll, I'll go move up. So the next person is the driver. Normally senior to the the back step person, but mm -hmm. not always. Sometimes they'll trade. Some people are more comfortable driving than others, right? It's, we all can drive. It's just, you know, they just Right. Decide. I assume driving is part of the training, but Absolutely. not everybody loves, you know. Well, the driving's the easy. It's the, you got to operate the pump. So you're outside. You now, some people, uh, uh, you know, I think, oh, geez, you're, you're on the line. You're on, you have that fire hose. You're in the fire. That's nerve wracking. Certainly is. But how about the responsibility of being outside, getting that water and making sure everything's working right? Because if you don't do your job, someone can get hurt. A lot of pressure. Absolutely. So, so that's, the, that, that's a firefighter, not an officer. They'll be the driver operator. And then the third seat's taken by the officer. It can be a lieutenant or a captain, and they're in charge of that group of people, mm -hmm. right? Right, uh, right. You know, they make all the calls. Yep, right? day to day. Just uh, Most of that leadership takes place here in the building, mm -hmm. right? It's just the day to day training and housework and, the, we, and I'll get into a day to day with you if you want, but mm -hmm. um, and then there's the scenes. They're, the officers are in charge of um, certainly line officers, the ones who are on the truck, they're pulling hose, they're fighting fire, they're doing those things, but they also have other responsibilities. They go on medical calls with the mm -hmm. uh, with the rescue crews, and uh, they're responsible for things like scene safety. So they'll usually take a step back and let the the, the firefighters that are on the ambulance, the back step, do patient care. The officer will be just kind of overall seen. Mm -hmm. Do we, we get you know force? What's next? Do we need to get furniture out of the way to move this patient? Do we need to call in a medic? They're kind of thinking big picture while everyone else is doing the hand hands on work. So. Right. So like, those are the roles. Like good leaders do. Yeah. Right. Right, you, you, it, it's hard to do. It, one thing that's hard to learn about when you start to move up is to delegate, because it really is a hands-on type of job, and you get a lot of satisfaction out of that, but there are points where, especially the hardest transition, I think, is when you become a deputy chief and you're running a group. So um, I'll just keep going, is yep. we have four groups in Arlington, group one, group two, group three, group four. They work a 24-hour shift, and then they're off for three days, so there's your four, right? Mm -hmm. So they each come in. Each group has a deputy chief who is in the shift commander. He's in charge of that group. Work assignments that day, uh, at a fire, anything that needs to be done that day. If, if I need something done, I go to the, the deputy chief and let him know what needs to be done. So mm -hmm. that transition is difficult. Yeah. You know, just because now you're not, you're really standing outside. Right. You know, you know so and, that's and, tough. And I assume nobody, you know, nobody 
uh, <laughs> signs up or takes the civil service exam right. with that in mind, the, the delegating part of that's the right. No, no. they they no. they want to be in the action. That's right. But it, it you know it's the natural progression in. It's a young person's job. So, yeah, I'm speaking just for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it 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 was, you know, um, you know, I had a lot of decision making if I wanted to go for the chief position, knowing it's an administrative position. Mm -hmm. Really, that's what it is. Um, but you know, we have capable. It, it's time to move on. Right. right. It's a natural. But progression. you know, it's interesting. You you say that it's an administrative position, and that's exactly what I <clears throat> would think in right. terms of the chief. But you, the, when we spoke to you last week or a couple of weeks ago, it was because of the fi recent fire at Tai Moon, and you, right. you, you told me, yeah, I headed over there. Right. I was the, you know, in the second you know, a bunch of arrivals, et cetera. Right. And, and then it looked like, uh, it sounded like there was a role for you or, or you. Yeah, I took and, command. But is that, is that, is that, yes. uh, is that your choice or is that just what anybody would do well, in your position or? We talk about, like I talked with the deputy chief, is, is I assume command when we get there. Um, don't have to, but even if I don't, I'm still the chief and I'm there, so I'm, in, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. still ultimately responsible for what happens. So, but it's a team effort. You know, mm -hmm. we use the incident command system, and, and all fire departments use the incident command system. It's kind of a, it's a structure that helps you command and, and keep track of resources, human resources, mm -hmm. right, and, and other things. But um, so I assume command when I get there, but. Immediately let the deputy chief know you're in charge of the fire scene. You're still operating those crews and assigning them. I'm just going to be another set of eyes and ears here. That stepping back, big picture, mm -hmm. long term. Do we need to get the Red Cross in here? What about it filling in? You know, things that. Right, all the big decisions. That, well, I mean, the, he's making the deputy's making the like life decisions, right? Like right, the life saving right decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's just he's focused on that, mm -hmm. and it you know you can get some tunnel vision. He's really it, it's it's kind of just thinking of long term. Do we need to get other crews in here for relief? Those kind of things. So it really is a team effort. It right. Really is a team. And you're right. I shouldn't have said big decisions. They're more big pic bigger big picture, pictures. Yes. The ones that you can. See See right, right. from having a little bit of distance, right, whereas right. he's he or she's right in it. Um, let me just ask you as an aside. Uh, I found myself when I was going to uh, ask you a question earlier. I almost said fireman, uh, you know, or yeah. fireman, right. and I think, you know, yeah. as I grew up, all the all the the books right. and et cetera, it was all, look at the firemen, right. look at the fire. And so how many women um, are, are you know? On the Arlington Firefighter? Uh, uh, yeah. Arlington Fire Department. The, we the have one, here. we have one female firefighter. Now, it's not from a lack of trying. We've had several and and they've come and gone for different reasons, you mm -hmm. know, but, but um, yeah, we have one, one firefighter right now. Yeah, I've actually caught myself a couple of times in this. It might be a generational thing, mm -hmm. right? It's just, it's just that normal, they're saying firefighter. Now, you might, I might correct myself again later just to remind myself to say firefighter, not fireman. Or, yeah. Or, or the guys, you know, try to say guys and girls. It's just, it's just it, I think it's generational. It's not meant to be disrespectful. Um, right. They, no, females I Females certainly have, no, and, and I know you weren't coming across that way. You know, females certainly have a place in this, this profession. Right. And Absolutely. so let, can we talk about that a little bit more, which is, I mean, one, as you said, and, and she's not the only one who's ever been here, right, but, right, right. but right now, currently there's one, and right. that's one out of how many? Uh, we have 71. Right, so that's right, right, right. tiny, tiny, tiny. And personally, in my you know 60 plus years of living on the planet, mm -hmm. I haven't seen, right. I don't remember seeing right. a woman firefighter. Really? In, you, like, right. I just don't remember. Yeah. Um, w what is it? Um, about this profession that is particular, that might be particularly, uh, you know, challenging for for a woman. Because I'm sure you, I, I know Arlington well enough right. to know that from the top down in a place like this, there's going to be an mm -hmm. openness, a, rece a receptivity, right. a, 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 will, a willingness, and an interest in making that work. Right. Right, and supporting your female firefighters right. in whatever way they need to, in the same way as you do others. Like any firefighter, correct. Right, right, exactly. right, right. So, but, I, you know, do you have any, like you've been at this for 27 years here in Arlington, right. any, any theories, any speculation, why is it that there are so few women uh, in, the, in the force? Um, I wish I had a good answer for you. I, I don't know if it's just cultural that it's, 
um, maybe the images we've been seeing on TV for our generation and and still maybe. But 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 if you watch like I, I watch a show, you know, look at the shows on TV aren't realistic, right? We all know that, but but you see a lot more diversity in those, right? If you think about Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto when we were kids, Squad 50, right? That was all men, um, mm -hmm. probably all white, mm -hmm. right? And now you watch the, which I don't particularly watch, to be honest with you, not just, I don't, right. but, but I see them. It, they're a, a very diverse mix, and that'll probably, I assume, be one of the first steps of what they see on TV, mm -hmm. right? Right, and, right. Um, but we're certainly, and you know, we're certainly an inclusive community. Mm -hmm. um, we I don't think there are any hurdles in anyone's way. I think it's probably just education, you know, job fairs at the high school to, you know, standing there to let the young women there know, mm -hmm. hey, this is a career field that's open to you too. You mm -hmm. know, um, but, but I, I don't, I don't. Know. And is there any anything at all that you can imagine in the work itself, either just you know, in any aspect of the work itself that just um, can be harder for for a, a woman to have to deal with? No, I, I think. There you, you go. Know, no, I don't think there is. I think it's, you know, there's um, there's good male firefighters and bad male firefighters, mm -hmm. and there'll be good female firefighters and bad female firefighters. It really, doesn't matter about the gender. It just matters about the person and mm -hmm. the effort they're willing to put into the job and how how, how respectful and how seriously they take it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and anyone can succeed in this career, man, man or woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, I don't think there's any hurdles. You know. Well. You heard it here first. Yeah, so yeah. All, uh, yeah. If there are, happen to be any young women out there in the mm -hmm. audience uh, tuning into this interview, just pay heed to what the chief is saying here. Well, and, I, and I'd like to question. add, and like I, I said to you when we first, well, and like I say to anyone in this department, it's it's an open door policy here, and that extends to anybody, uh, male or female, but that wants to know what it takes and what, what's the path. I'd you know just call me, and and I'd be happy to let you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so. That's great. Yeah. You know, you mentioned a little earlier in the conversation the difference between medical calls and, and, okay. and, and fire. Um, how, and, and I was noting with you when we talked about Tai Moon that it seemed to me that that, you know, a, a two alarm fire as such as that was where you had uh, some, some support from neighboring towns, yes. et cetera, um, seemed to me like an unusual occurrence here in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the proportion generally of, of, of calls that you're responding okay. to that are that are of the sort that you would call medical calls okay. versus fire? Yeah, so we average, you know, around 5,200 calls a year. Some years a little slower. Some I think our high is probably about 5,400. Our low is about 4,800. So right in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, 50 to 60 percent of medical. The rest are non-medical. Mm. Um, so. I'll, the, the non-medical calls are anywhere, I, we go, we, like a term is from smells to bells. <laughs> uh, we, we're really, you know, we're a fire department, but we're really all hazards, to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from cats and trees to, you know, uh, people go into the, fall through the ice in the water to- Or something smells. I smell an odor of gas, mm -hmm. uh, a, a false alarms, those kind of things. So multitude of, multitude of calls. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I've been on so many different kinds, which is what right. makes the job great, to be honest right. with you. You, know, you come in every day, you never know what's going to happen. So that's, what, that's what's fun about it. But, but um, So that's kind of the non-medicals. And then, again, the medicals make up about 50 to 60% of our calls. Mm -hmm. so. so at least half or? More yeah, than half. Yeah, more yeah, than half. Yeah, definitely more. Than, that's why I say it's 50 to 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, th you know, I had said to you that, that I was probably going to ask you some pretty basic questions, and I already have. And that's okay. Um, but one, another one that, that I've always been interested in, and I can't imagine that our audience isn't, is the, the inherent um, dynamic in being a firefighter that is fundamentally different from almost any other profession that we can imagine is this idea that you have, it's quiet. It's quiet, and there are long hours, and there's not much to do, and there's no calls com coming in, right. and and then boom, right? You got to be ready and on it, and and truly ready to face something that you you know may never have seen before, right. uh, et cetera. Just talk as somebody who has been living you know with that right. um, as both the person who is lolling about perhaps right. and then needs to get going, um, and now as as the leader, right? Um, just tell us a little bit about that dynamic. I mean, does it does is it a certain kind of person who responds well to that? Is that something no, that you train have, people for? You know. Yeah, we have all sorts of personalities here. Yeah, you know, it's just yes, we have quiet people, 
we have people that won't stop talking, and I'm one of them, and I'm guilty of that. But um, we have um, people that are um, hunters and fishermen, and we've got people that are co computer nerds. You know, just that there is no, um, I can't. Right, there's you know, no firefighter there's no, for fire. Yeah, you know, there really isn't. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think what helps with, what's great about, um, I think, any fire department is that blend of new person, and then the experienced person. That's what, you know, I, I remember the first, um, uh, I'll use myself as an example, how do you get through it? Um, experience really helps. It's, after a while, it's really, you know, when you walk into someone's house and they're in trouble, that snaps you out of any kind of boredom you were in earlier, you're ready to go. That, mm -hmm. That's not a problem. But um, my first code, do you know what a code, that's when someone's mm -hmm. not yep. breathing, they're, you know, mm -hmm. they're basically, they're dead. And when you're gonna do CPR on them, I froze. Now, probably for three seconds. To me, it felt like an attorney, mm -hmm. but I remember just standing there. I was fresh out of the academy in EMT school, but I was with an eight-year veteran. Him and I were on the ambulance together, and he just jolted me. Just, he, I don't know if he just, he just said, hey, get the oxygen. And I once he said that, uh -huh. I just you know, did it, and everything went fine. And it was just, I think, and, and you said, how do you handle it? It's just when you first come on, everything is nerve-wracking. You don't know which, which direction to go. You, 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 there's the just helping the people, and then it's the, that dynamic with the other firefighters. You want to fit in. You want to be, a, you know, have them respect you. So how do you handle all that? Mm -hmm. What you do is you identify the people that you see other people respect, and you model them, of course, right? And then just over time, you just things slow down, just mm -hmm. like a Tom right, Brady, just like a professional, just like a professional athlete, athlete. Of some sort, huh? Things slow down. Um, you you stay calm when other people aren't, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. It's just you really yeah. do. You learn that 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 um, you have time. You can make decisions. Everything doesn't have to happen. You take those few extra seconds to think, and and you just learn that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, and again, I think that's what's great about having. The, like the mentor system here, where you constantly have new people coming, people retiring, it's just a, a constant change, and, and that experience, those experienced people just to tutor to you and mentor you, so mm -hmm. really, that really helps. Um, I've got a, this is a really kind of very silly and trivial question, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Um, but uh, I and, and, and the people that I know have often noted um, that when there is a call, there seems to be a number of fire engines okay. responding yep. to what we get that. looks like, right. uh, you know, Something not minor. much going on. Right. Um, how did, what is the protocol okay. for that kind of thing? How, how is it that that is so, such a common seeming occurrence? So we get that all the time. People say, why, why do you send so many apparatus or so many? And it really what we need there is manpower. Okay, so for example, we have a medical call back when I first came on, we'd send just the ambulance and that would put that crew in a tough spot because sometimes they'd be kind of hemming and hawing. Should I call for help? And I don't want to bother the folks back at the station. It's one in the morning, right? And you don't right. want that. They're not good. If these are young people. Right, right. So I've right got, I'm a junior person on the job and I you know, got some 25 year vet yelling at me. What are you doing? And back in my day, I used to carry him myself. So <laughs> well, a long time ago, uh, and I think it was the right decision, we decided, for example, on a medical, we're always going to send an engine or the ladder with the ambulance crew just to have the bodies there to help. Mm -hmm. We don't need a lot of the material. Off it, but you know that's how we get to bring the truck with us. Um, and I'll use a code, like a, a, a code for example. Someone's stopped breathing and, and their heart's not beating. Um, the the two folks in the ambulance, they're working that person. They can't lift them. They can't carry them. They can't get other equipment. They can't move the clear with the way. Um, if the person happens to be heavy, carry them by themselves. So we just want those people there to help, mm -hmm. and that's why. And again, what determines that? The nature of the call. So we have SOGs for different kinds of calls, and I, I'll use the gas example. Um, if there's an odor of gas out on the street, we'll send one engine to investigate. It's out in the street, it's safe, it's dissipating into the air, fine. If it's an odor of gas in someone's home, we send the ladder truck, the engine, and the shift commander, because mm -hmm. that's much more serious. So the simple answer is, the type of call, the nature of the call will be determined, but not by the shift commander. They, they're, they're, SOGs, uh, the standard operating guidelines, dispatch and dispatches us out. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly, there's been times when C2 will be listening, that's the shift commander, will be listening to the call on the radio and say, won't you start the ladder also? They, they hear something that Some triggers something in them. They certainly, in any moment, they, they have that authority and we want them to have it to make some decisions that are, you know, we're not, though, like I said, it's good to have standard operating procedures because that helps to do things the same way all the time. 
but we also have to be flexible. Right. So and give give that kind of discretion and confidence absolutely. to your to the commander. to your ship commanders. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know the so it, it sounds. <laughs> I'm not trying to be glib, but it sounds like, to some degree, people should understand that when they see multiple fire engines heading somewhere, it, it's really, um, they're very large, very uh, visible, very loud taxis. That's, uh, well, sometimes, and I had someone ask me on a call one day, said, did you have to bring the fire engine? And I said, well, how else would we have gotten here? <laughs> you know, just to say that that's how we travel. And when we clear that call and we'll come back to quarters, we can get another call. Right. That could mm -hmm. be, we, so we need to be always ready to go. So, I was surprised by something that you said earlier when you were describing the crew on the truck, uh, on the trucks, <clears throat> and you you described three positions. So, is, is it basically a three-person crew on yeah. each truck? And yeah. Why? Uh, I, for whatever reason, I I've always thought maybe it's TV and, bo and you know, children's books or something that that uh, made me think that there were more. They usually, yeah. Well, it, that's a funding issue. Mm. However. So, uh, you know what, there might be a good place. Let me, I'll um, um, describe our department, like how many stations, how yes. many people, and that kind of ties into that. So, uh, we have three fire stations in town. We have, we're in fire headquarters, which is down in, in, the, in the center. It's the octagon shaped one with the big tower. We have um, Highland Station, which is up on Mass Ave, right between Stop and Shop and uh, Jimmy's, mm -hmm. right? And then we have the Park Circle Station, which is up by the water tower. So, every day we have a minimum manning of 15. That includes the shift commander. That doesn't include the staff. That's people that are on the line. Line is the people that respond to the fires. Mm -hmm. um, so we have 15, so we have three engines. Those are the engines carry the water, they carry the fire hose, and they all have three people on them. And then we have the ladder truck, that's the big ladder truck, that carries three people, so that gets us to what, 12? Mm -hmm. 12. We have the ambulance. So our yeah, ambulance is an ambulance. We're all EMTs. But they're also firefighters, so they perform, perform both roles. So that gets us to 14, and the shift commander makes 15. Certainly, you know, um, uh, four would be better, right? More people are better, but there's also there's budget considerations mm -hmm. and staffing considerations. Um, but we're fortunate. We have, we're part of the Metro Fire Group, which is all the, not all, but most of the departments within the 128 belt, including mm -hmm. Boston and Cambridge. And we have what's called mutual aid agreements, and they're invaluable. That's, you saw it happen the other day at 663 Mass Ave. Once we get to the point where we think we need help, we call and they come free of charge, and we do the same for them. Right. So that, that really is an under, underestimated uh, value to that. It allows departments not to go bankrupt. You know what I mean? To have to, yeah. to, you know, we have our insurance policy. We're here in case you need us. We can get going, we can get started. And most of the time we can put the fire out ourselves. But if it's something that extends or gets to be a little undaunting, we just fire alarm calls and they come in to help and we do the same for them, so. Yeah, you know, it's, <clears throat> that's interesting to hear because um, uh, in various ACMI uh, programs and, and, and interviews I've had over the years, um, the issues of sharing resources with surrounding yeah. towns, whether it's you know police and, and animal control and uh, wow. or, or in this case fire, um, you know that seems like fiscally a good idea yes. when if and when you can do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen nearly as seamlessly as it appears to uh, in your context. It is seamless in the we've been. Since I've been on, and, and, and I think forever, like mm -hmm. there's been mutual aid. We've always come to help each other. You, you really need to. You know, you, you, we, you couldn't fund a fire department for the f worst case scenario all the time. Right. It would just there, be, there, it would just be would impossible. Be, right. That's It'd a be, very bloated, yeah. you know, kind right. of department for sure. Yeah. Um, just, a, just a couple more questions, Chief. One, one is you had referred earlier in the interview to it, uh, this being a civil service. Okay. Um, you know, situation here, um, and and of course I know that what that means, among other things, is you've told from your own story. You take a civil service exam, right. and then you wait for some period of time right. to hear back. You know whether there's going to be an opening and whether you're invited to exactly. apply, et cetera. Um, are there any? We have spoken in in recent times, uh, and again with the police department here right. in town. There have been some issues around the fact that it's a civil service right. uh, uh, setup um, in terms of the discretion that the, you know, right. the chief has to make certain kinds of decisions around personnel and all that right. stuff. Um, that's how it's come up before. Right. I'm wondering what, you know, how, 
how either common or uncommon is that um, for fire departments in, in towns and cities? And, you know, what are the issues that can arise for you um, from, you know, just from it being a civil service uh, well, we civil fall, servant? Yeah, we, we, um, we fall under the same rules as the police department does with fire civil service goes. You know, our hands are tied. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you're referring to, I, I think, you know, as far as the hiring process goes and the day-to-day, -day, there's some pros and cons to civil service. There certainly are, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I have heard the manager, when he speaks about it, it, it seems to more what he feels the civil service is, um, can be hand-tying is the disciplinary part the disciplinary Yeah, part I mean, I it. think that's how it's come it, up, obviously, right, right, right. in the last couple of years. But. We haven't had that issue in the, in the fire department, mm -hmm. so... Um, but I'm just curious, I mean, you mentioned that there were pros and cons, and again, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm well, just uh, curious about what, you, for your, you know, for the operation, again, of a department where you haven't had to worry about, like, right. the, 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 you know, some of the more extreme situations or something. Right. Well, it, you know, and it depends. I, it's funny. It depends who you ask, right? Now, I, I think uh, this is a pro, but some people think it's a con. We talked about residency. What I like about civil service, and some, what some people don't like, is that residents do get preference. And it creates a certain, as far as I'm concerned, esprit de corps. We all come, we have a common bond, like, you know, I'm now working with uh, uh, people I graduated high school's kids. And they, I know them, and they know me, and uh, we might not even know each other, but we had similar experiences, and, and um, but we also have examples of, uh, I told you, the military folks that are, we have a few here that decided they wanted to get on Arlington when they got out of the service. They weren't from Arlington, and they've been valuable. Mm -hmm. They've been great, great employees. I'm not saying that they muddy the water at all. So, mm -hmm. um, so your hands are tied, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. But, but, but it hasn't, I, I, I haven't seen the problem in our department with that. I, I actually think it's a positive, okay? So, um, promotion-wise, you know, we take tests. We, you know, usually, pick the person who got the highest score. Mm -hmm. And it's worked out fine. Um, but your cans can be tied with that sometimes. See, there might be someone who, who came in second who you might think is a better candidate, but short of that first person being a total problem, mm -hmm. the first person gets a job. So, but that can also be good, because you know, one of the things civil service did was to get rid of nepotism, right? It for, you know, so if you've got the top score, you can't just be skipped because mm. the chief's <laughs> kid, my kid is in third place and I want to make them. So you know what I mean? So you right. really have to decide right. uh, what's important. Um, I, I think civil services work for us. Um, but I understand that, you know, right. we have to look at some other things. It's a really good, I mean, that's, that's a good response as far as I'm concerned because it, it reminds me that it's very similar to but the pros and cons of standardized testing where, you know, at least right. you have the same way to compare everybody right. and it at least is right. theoretically. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity now, right? And it's always, but really it's been in the last year. Um, so, you know, civil service because of residency and, and let's face it, Arlington's a predominantly white uh, community. Mm -hmm. Not all white, we certainly have a minority population. Why they're not taking the test, when you ask me, I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know I don't know why, I mean it's open to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we need to do a better job of reaching out, you know, mm -hmm. going to, you know, into the schools, those kind of things. Um, um, but, yeah, but, what, but what civil service, we have two Hispanic employees. They were veterans who picked Arlington to come to, and now they're on our, on our department. So it actually brought, civil service brought diversity right. to the department. So, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. It really it is. Really it's is interesting because, you know, it, you, you were mentioning that it's, it's come up, the, the whole question of civil service and its effect on the, on, right, right. On, on the fire and police, it's, it's really come up more around disciplinary options or not um, recently. Right. But before that, I remember talking to Chief Ryan about this for years uh, from the police department, um, that the hiring you know, having your hands tied for hiring right. makes it a little bit difficult to, you know, achieve the goals that you might otherwise right. have. So. But it really isn't as difficult um, to bypass hiring. Like, uh, civil service will give you the benefit of the doubt more than when you're trying to terminate, right? Right. That's when you're trying to terminate, yeah. usually the employee gets the benefit of the doubt, and there's many stories of oh, that, right? Yeah. Um, because then at that point they've got some tenure, right, you know, so right. they want to make sure they're protected. So mm -hmm. yeah, look at 
there's hurdles. I don't care what system we use. Even if we got rid of civil service, there would be hurdles. Right. Right. So you just got to navigate through them and, do, and hopefully you just get the best candidates you can get and then see what happens. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I appreciate how much time you spent with us. I have one more question for you. Go ahead. Um, and that is, given the fact that you've been here for 27 years, you've been now chief for two, two. plus or yep. two years, two. Um, uh, you... Uh, spoke very um, uh, laudably about your predecessor, you know, calling him just the best chief so far, et cetera. Uh. What is your vision for, uh, oh. for the department? What, is your, what do you see, basically, um, as where, you know, what your primary responsibility is? Is it more to kind of carry on um, I'm, and I'm, keep I'm, things yeah. at the same I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to admit, like, I just... You know, when I took over the the ship, it was pointed in a great direction, and I and I, I just want to keep it steered that way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this town. I'd like to say, f first of all, I, I'm very fortunate to work. You know, because I hear other chiefs, and you know, what you hear goes in other communities. I really have a two-headed monster here. I have the employees that I have to work with, and and, and every day, and and then I have the town hall. You know, town hall, and I couldn't have two better groups of people. You know, we we look at is every day perfect? No. But I have the support of the union, and, and they have mine, and I have the support of Town Hall and Adam Chapdelaine and Sandy and, and, and Karen Malloy, and, um, and they know that they have mine too. You know what I mean? And so, so that's been great. Um, my goal is just to make sure, one, that uh, the men and women of this department have everything they need to, one, do their jobs effectively and safely, and continue that, and two, to make sure that we're giving the best um, support and protection and you know wh whatever the citizens of the town need and it's not just fires we go into the schools and talk to the kids we're out doing inspections mm -hmm. we, we serve a lot of roles uh, COVID you know we didn't even really talk about COVID but um, that that's been a unique experience right um, so I'm very proud of our membership and how they you know stood up when that happened because it was a lot of unknowns. You know, we're mm -hmm. certainly in a better place now, and, um, but it, when it first happened, you know, we didn't know how it was going to affect us and, uh, personally and if we're bringing it home and those kind of things. And, and uh, everyone just did their jobs to the best they could and, and, and beyond. And, and uh, I couldn't be more prouder of, of, of this department, really. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you just brought up COVID because it's a, you know, a, some people might think it's really a glaring gap right. in our conversation. And I'm sure that there were so many ways in which your own job, right. as well as all right. of our lives, uh, were, were kind of up, was upended. And perhaps we can return for a future conversation Certainly. and talk about that more intensively. Yeah. But I felt like, I feel like it's a little bit of a relief to have such a nice oh, uh, right. and, and extended mm -hmm. conversation covering a lot of, for me at least, very interesting, right. uh, interesting just information that sure. you've shared with us um, without, <laughs> without, the spec without acknowledging the specter of COVID, right. which has been right. so, you know, impossible to escape. So right. guess what? We just had a COVID-free 45-minute <laughs> conversation. Yeah. And, um, and again, we, we, may, we may return for, certainly. we will certainly return for other visits for other reasons. What I, and what I would recommend, and if, if it's not on your plate, is the real heroes, or the real, it was the Health and Human Services Department, Christine Bongiorno and, and um, Natasha Warden. They, um, we had our role, and we certainly we had a direct role going into people's homes and, and dealing with sick people and those kind of things. But the day to day, just the, the broad spectrum from just, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, tracing people? I'm mm -hmm. I'm right, contact tracing. Contact tracing. And then uh, did you get a chance to go to the clinic? The, yeah. Uh, the, the, I yeah. mean, just yeah. an amazing job. And the, and the town and should be very grateful that they have uh, people like that working over there. Uh, we're very, and I feel very fortunate. 100 yeah. percent agreed. 100 percent. Absolutely. Uh, we are really, really yeah. lucky. And uh, boy, have we leaned on them, and boy, do they deserve a nice long vacation. They certainly point. do. Are you listening, Adam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, Chief, just thanks for welcoming us so mm -hmm. warmly here, mm -hmm. um, for uh, arranging for no emergency <laughs> calls during our conversation as well, and really for sharing both the 
you know, aspects of your own life and trajectory here, but also of the way that firefighting gets done, yeah. uh, giving us a glimpse behind these, these lovely uh, big doors uh, here and uh, just giving us a sense of, of what the men and women who yeah. work with you and for you are well, doing. Well, thank you. And, and I think the last thing I'd like to say to the people of Arlington is just feel safe that you have a, a real good group of professional firefighters here that are willing to do anything they need to help you. So, All right. Well, we look forward to more conversations with you in mm -hmm. the future. Um, we welcome you <laughs> to, your <laughs> to the yeah. position of chief. We appreciate you being here and being with us, and we really do look forward to next time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Um, this has been Talk of the Town. I've been talking to our fire chief. Kevin Kelly, and uh, I'm James Milan. We appreciate his time, and we appreciate yours as well. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <music>